Our Bible study tonight from Psalm 94. Psalm 94. This psalm has no title in the Hebrew. Therefore, there is no any indication to date or authorship of this psalm. Some think that this psalm is written by Moses the prophet. But in the Septuagint version, which is the Greek translation to the Hebrew version, there is a title, and the title says, A Psalm of David for the fourth day of the week, which is Wednesday. And it was a special psalm for that day in the service of the temple. And according to this title, the author is David. And according to St. Gregory of Nyssa, the fourth day of the week, which is Wednesday, it concerns what Judas the traitor did on Wednesday of the Passion Week, when actually he uh, made a conspiracy with the religious leaders of Israel to deliver the Lord Jesus Christ to them. That's why this psalm actually contain a description of a wicked and oppressive government, such as that under which the Israelites lived in Babylon during the exile, or this government, whether the religious or the civil government that condemned the Lord Jesus Christ to death. So some people think that this psalm belonged to the closing prayer years of the exile. Uh, and refer to the harsh treatment which the Israelite had to suffer in Babylon. So maybe David wrote it in a prophetic way about the exile in pa Babylon or about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ and the betrayal by Judas. Some other think it is about the oppression of the uh, Israelite in Egypt be before their exodus from Egypt. So this, this psalm is a prayer for the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He was praying that the righteous judgment of God be manifested. Also, in this psalm, we will see expression of confidence in the ultimate triumph of the righteous. It is written by and for a suffering community so not only about the Lord Jesus Christ in his suffering, but about the suffering church. God's people are assaulted by the wicked, and then watching their attacks, watching their attackers, the persecutors, seem to get away with it. Prophetically, some think the psalm was written about the oppressed and persecuted church. And it is an appeal to God as because God is the judge of heaven and earth. And the people are addressing God to stand for his people against uh, the enemies of God and the enemies of the church. St. Augustine says this psalm is about to teach patience in the suffering of the righteous. It commands patience against the prosperity of the wicked. So when we see the prosperity of wicked, we should not get frustrated. We need to learn to be patient and to build up patience. This is the point of the whole um, psalm from beginning to its end. This psalm is 23 verses. From verse 1 to 7, an appeal to God against oppressors. 8 to 11, rebuking the senseless rebels. 12 to 15, God's merciful dealings with his followers. 16 to 19, God's people confidence in him. The last four verses from 20 to 23, foreseeing the punishment of the wicked. So let's start from verse 1. O Lord the God, to whom vengeance belongs. O God, 
to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth. So, this psalm starts with a simple and profound recognition that vengeance belongs to God. That's why he called him God of vengeance. God sees and judges righteously among mankind and will bring vengeance as appropriate. The psalmist appeals to God who has the power and the right to punish. As we read in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35, vengeance is mine and I will recompense. So the psalmist is appealing to God to manifest himself in all splendor of his presence. That's why he said, shine forth. As we read in Psalm 50, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth. So he is asking God of vengeance to shine forth. The word vengeance in modern understanding means or refers to unhealthy feeling of hatred, anger, and resentment. But when you read the word vengeance in the scripture, it, it doesn't bear the meaning of anger, resentment, or hatred. No. Simply it means the act of justice, which gives to all what they deserve. As we say in the divine liturgy, and he gives to each one according to his deeds, whether they good or evil. So vengeance in the scripture means giving justice to the oppressed and bringing punishment upon those who persist on oppressing others. This actually gives assurance to people that recompense is in the hand of God who is aware of the inner secrets and intentions of his creatures. Vengeance is not in the hand of man, but in the hand of God. Vengeance belongs to one who sees more than what we see and knows more than what we know. This actually should alarm the sinners and those who do wrong. Because there is a God to whom vengeance belongs and who will certainly call them to an account in the last day. But also, it is encouragement for those who suffer wrong and suffer oppression to be patient and to commit themselves to God who judges righteously and will give each one according to his deeds. So the appeal here is made to God in view of the crimes committed by others and is repeated twice, O oh God of vengeance, was repeated twice for emphasis and to denote sincerity and intensity in the petition. In addition to the repetition, the psalmist connect the vengeance of God with his glory. That's why he told him, shine forth. Which means, when actually your justice is manifested, then your glory will be more glorified. You will be more glorified among the people. As if the psalmist is saying to God, show yourself as God who will by no means free the guilty. So, in the end, vengeance upon sin and sinners is part of God's own glory. Verse 2, Rise up, O judge of the earth, render punishment to the proud. 
The psalmist committed the work of vengeance to God, but will still pray that God would fulfill his promise and render punishment to the proud. God protects and defends his people, and for this purpose, God is requested by the psalmist to rise up to defend and protect his people. He seems as, in, yeah, in the perception of the psalmist, as if God laid down and asleep, as if he is quite negligent and careless for them. That's in the imagination of the psalmist. Therefore, they desire that God would awoke and arise and use his power and show himself higher than their enemies. Render punishment to the proud because this is a just recompense to the people who are confident in their own strength, who are manifesting in their pride, manifesting their pride in depriving others from their right. So they use their power to deprive others from their rights. Verse 3, Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? This question in verse 3, how long will the wicked and the proud triumph and be allowed to glory in their evil? How long will they be allowed to maintain their arrogance? How long will evil people continue to boast? This also, this question, add a note of urgency to the psalmist prayer. God, until when you will wait? Until when you allow these wicked people to boast in their arrogance? So, the only question is about the power of evil. How long? What I mean, the only question, he knows that the power of evil will be defeated, no matter what. So he is not questioning whether the power of evil will be defeated or not. But he is asking how long? How long will you allow the wicked people to oppress the godly people? So there is no room for doubting the power of God or his love, or his victory over the evil. But it is a cry of weakness and impatience. But also it has an element of faith in it. Because as I told you, the question is how long, not whether the power of evil will prevail or not. So, with combination of boldness and humility, the psalmist is asking God, to give an account for the time until the righteous vengeance will be accomplished upon the wicked. The same question actually was asked in uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 6, when the, the souls under the altar cried out to God, how long, how long would you avenge for our blood? So, the triumphing of the wicked may seem wicked, long. Their victory may seem long, but it is short time. As we read in Job chapter 20, verse 5, the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite is but for a moment.
Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? Then in verse 4, he said, They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. So after asking in verse 3, how long will the wicked and the proud will be allowed to glory in their evil, the psalmist goes on to describe their evil actions. They are haughty, arrogant, speak defiant, insolent things, and they boast in themselves, not in God. They are insolent and take a pleasure in magnifying themselves. So the psalmist is asking, how long shall they be permitted to have such success as may seem to justify them in their exaltation? If they are successful, then they will feel that God is blessing them and approving their ungodly way. But they don't know that there will come a day of giving an account for all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against God and against his truth, his ways, and his people. He appointed a day for recompense in which he will appear to judge the world in righteousness and give each one according to his deeds. Verse 5, they break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. So they are crushing God's people. They destroy them and break them in pieces and afflict them. They hurt the righteous, but on the contrary, a mark of the righteous is their love for God's people. So the righteous people, they love God's people, but the wicked, they crush the people of God. God's people are his heritage, his inheritance. And there are those that for his sake hate them. So the enemies of the church hate God's people because they hate God. That's why they seek their destruction. Verse 6, they slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. They slay the widow and the stranger who are weak and feeble, helpless and friendless. Another thing noted about the wicked is their attack against the weak and the disadvantaged and the unprivileged, extending even to killing them. Some evildoers even kill the widow and the orphans. They are merciless and take a pleasure in harming those that are least able to help themselves. They cannot help themselves. They not only oppress, but they slay the widow and the stranger. Not only they neglect the fatherless and the orphans, but they murder them. Because the fatherless and the widow and the stranger, they are weak, unprotected, and sometimes they are lying at their mercy. Like Nabuchaz Nasser carried on his wars with great cruelty, and he did not spare neither age, sex, or condition. Verse 7. Yet they say, the Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. So the psalmist continued to wonder, for how long are you going to leave them? When shall this wickedness of the wicked people come to an end? St. Jerome says, Who is the widow and who is the stranger and who is the orphan? He said the widow is the soul of the sinner who lost God as her bridegroom. 
that is the widow. The stranger is the homeless who lacks a permanent residence. Like a new believer who quickly falls with the first offense he encounters. So he lost his residence in the house of God. And the fatherless, the orphan, is he who loses God as his father. St. Jerome adds and says, those are the victims of the wicked heretics. The heretics who are teaching heresies and false doctrines. Who are the victims? The people who left God as their bridegroom, people who lost God as their father, people who have no residence in the church. The wicked are ignorant and arrogant toward God. They actually claim that God does not see, that God does not understand. So they deny that he exists in the manner that he is revealed in the Bible. This ignorance of God leads them to a deceived, misled arrogance toward him. They say God of Jacob does not understand, implying that God was indifferent to the conduct of the people. Whether they do good or bad, God is indifferent. He would not punish the wicked. The sinners have nothing to fear at his hand because God will not punish the wicked. They called the God, God of Jacob. So maybe God of Jacob is added by the psalmist itself as an argument strengthening the faith of God's people, as if he is saying, even if they say God does not understand, God does not see, but I want, don't want you to forget that our God is the God of Jacob, God who made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God will take notice, take care of us, and avenge his people. Or maybe the enemies of God, they said God of Jacob, not the psalmist. As if they are mocking the confidence of the godly people in their God. You call your God is God of Jacob, he is a God of covenant, but where is he? He is not taking any notice of what is going to you, uh, what's happening to you. Where is the God who made a covenant with Jacob, with Isaac, and with Abraham. When men believe that God does not see, then there is no reason to wonder that they give full freedom to their harsh, terrible passions. Now we can see strong connection between atheism and sexual immorality. If I don't believe that God exists, then I can do whatever I can do. I can believe whatever I believe because there is no accountability. There is no God who will hold me accountable in the last day. Saint Jerome says, they consider the long suffering of God as a lack of understanding when they said God of Jacob does not understand. And Saint Augustine says, nobody can escape the eye of God who sees not only the secret places, but even the depths of the heart. Nobody can escape the eye of God, who sees not only the secret places, but even the depths of the heart. Verse 8, Understand you senseless among the people, and you fools when when you will be wise. Who are the senseless and who are the fools? From verse 8 to 11, the psalmist turns from pleading with God to argue either with those of his people who are tempted to agree with their oppressors that God does not see and God does not understand. 
to think that God is imperfect in his power and God will not defend them. Sometimes when we go through a difficult time, say, where is God? Where is his promises? So the senseless here and the fools can be people from the psalmist uh, congregation who actually start, because of the temptation, start to agree with their enemies that God does not see and God does not understand. Or maybe he is speaking to the enemies of God who believed that God does not see and God does not understand their wickedness. Or we can say verse 8 can be applied to anyone who lacks the spiritual discernment to realize that in spite of the temporary triumph of the wicked, but God is still rules. God still rules. The word senseless means he looks like a man, but he does not have the understanding of a human being. And he asked the fools, when will you be wise? When you will, will you be wise? When will you understand? When will you attend to the truth? Because the wise know that God sees and regards all you say and do. So he is asking them to speak and act accordingly, to be wise. And we should know that God will actually hold us accountable in the last day. Also, it implies that these fools had been like this for a long time. That's why he said, will you not under when will you be wise? When will you be wise? Which means they are fools for a very long time. And now it is time that they should arouse from their condition and act like wise people. This question actually is a powerful against modern atheism and against as against that of his day. We wish we can ask the same question to the atheist. When will you be wise? You who think that God does not care and God does not notice and God does not exist, please think again. Then he said in verse 9, He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? So, the argument here is very simple. If the one who made our ears not hearing the things we say, so here the logic is very simple but strong. The eye who created the ear definitely can hear. And the God, sorry, the God who created the ear can hear. And God who created the eye definitely can see. If God doesn't leave even the heathen, the nations, without rebukes and chastisement, as he did with Sodom and Gomorrah, and as he did during the time of Noah, shall he not much more punish those among his own people who do wrong? As he says in verse 10, he who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge, God who teaches us knowledge, shall not correct us. He who instructs the nations, shall he not correct? God has authority over the nations of the earth. He has them under his control. He brings heavy judgment on them, as he did in the past, by bringing flood upon the earth and sweeping away its inhabitants at once, and by actually burning Sodom and Gomorrah and consuming these two cities from the face of the earth. So God, who instructed the nations, definitely convey great lessons to man. He teaches us. And shall not such a being, God, 
in individual cases will correct me, reprove me for sin? So God not only has given the light of reason, but he has shown man what is true wisdom and understanding. And he that does this, shall he not know? If God give us the light of reason, and God give us wisdom and understanding, so this God, shall he not know? So the answer to the illusion of the wicked, that God does not see and God does not un understand, and to the doubt of the faithless, God not only sees their works, but God knows their very thoughts. God does not only see what we do, and God does not only hear what we say, but he searches the thoughts and the heart of the man. That's why in verse 11 he said, The Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. So he does not only hear what we say or see what we do, but he, he sees and knows even our thoughts. God's wisdom is so great that he even knows the thought of men. This great God must be appropriately feared, respected, and obeyed. It was important for the senseless and the faithless and the fools to hear and to understand this. St. Paul actually quoted verse 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of man that they are futile. He quoted them in Romans chapter 11. Sorry, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, verse 20. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 when he spoke about God's triumph over the exaltation of the earthly wisdom, and when he spoke about the futility of man's intellect against God. So, how can man, this feeble creature of a day, think about plans he cannot comprehend or faith. One of the titles of God, he is incomprehensible. God knows that our thoughts are worthless and simply a vapor. Anyone who thinks they are getting away with anything just because judgment is not immediate is senseless fool. If I think I can get away with my sins because God did not judge me immediately and innocently, this is foolishness. Only a fool think that, that the all-seeing God does not see. And only the fool believe that judge of all the earth will not bring justice at the proper time. God doesn't only know that our, uh, God doesn't only know our thoughts, but he knows that our thoughts are futile, vain, and foolish. Verse 12, Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. From verse 12 to 15, the psalm starts to comfort himself and to comfort the sufferers in the people of God with the thought that they are being taught by God if God allowed a hardship or persecution, there is lesson behind it. God wants to teach us a lesson, a lesson. And sooner or later, the right must have its rights. The righteous will be avenged. So the psalmist comfort himself by considering in how many ways the righteous man is blessed. That's why he said, blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. Those who are taught by God are blessed because this will give them such an insight and enlightenment into the ways of God's providence. They will be enabled 
to endure calmly and patiently without grumbling, without murmuring, without losing heart until the day of retribution overtakes the wicked. God instruct and teach his people from his word, from the scripture, from his law. And the word instruct can be understood also as chastise. بالعربي توبة للرجل الذي تؤدبه. In English, instruct. So instruct can come and, and means chastise, discipline. So the people of God, when God chastises us, we are not chastised in wrath, but because he loves us. Not the chastisement of a cruel one, but of a tender-hearted father who always does it for his prophet, our prophet, an advantage. Therefore, this man who is disciplined by God is blessed. The blessedness of chastening appears in many, many references in the scripture. And it is the main point of Elihu's teaching in the book of Job. This is a wonderful promise to those who receive the teaching from God's word. Blessed is the man whom you instruct, O Lord, and teach out of your law. Verse 13, that you may give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit is dug for the wicked. These people will have rest when the inevitable days of adversity will come. Their rest is theirs until the pit is dug for the wicked, until God sets all things right in his judgment, until the last day. That's why St. Augustine says, have patience therefore everyone, if you are a Christian in the time of malice, Days of malice are those in which the ungodly appear to flourish and the righteous to suffer. But the suffering of the righteous is the rod of the Father. He's chastising us. And the prosperity of the ungodly is their own snare. The, this is the pit that's dug for them. So in the midst of the affliction and chastisement, the children of God will enjoy divine comfort, rest, peace of heart. Whereas the wicked in the midst of their prosperity will feel a kind of emptiness, of deprivation and lack of peace. What is the pit that is dug for the wicked? It can be the hill, the pit of destruction, the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So the pit, the hill, and the lake is dug and prepared by the sovereign will and unchangeable purpose and decree of God for all the wicked. Verse 14. For the Lord will not cast off his people, nor will he forsake his inheritance. So this is a beautiful and powerful assurance given to all of us. He, the repetition here and emphasis, God will not forsake his inheritance. So, maybe we will be chastised by God, but this doesn't mean at all that God cast his people off, nor he forsakes them. St. Augustine comments on this verse and says, He chastens for a season. He condemns not forever. The others he spares for a season and will condemn them forever. The others are the wicked. So make your choice. Do you wish temporary suffering and eternal punishment or eternal punishment? 
temporal happiness or eternal life? What does God threaten? Eternal punishment. What does he promise? Eternal rest. His scourging is good. It is temporary. But his sparing the wicked is also temporary because they will suffer eternal punishment. Verse 15. But judgment will return to righteousness at the last day. And all the upright in heart will follow it. So ultimately, in the last day, righteousness and justice will triumph. In due time, whether in this life here, on the eternal one, the divine justice will prevail. When all will perceive the wisdom of God and the reason of his long suffering on the wicked, why God was so patient with the wicked, something that will fill the upright in heart with peace and joy when we see the justice of God is fulfilled then we will enjoy peace in our heart God promises to bring his righteous reign and judgment to all things and bringing satisfaction to the upright in heart that's why we repeat it in every divine liturgy he will appear to judge the world in righteousness and give each one according to his deeds. The exercise of judgment shall be so manifest to the whole world as to show that there is a righteous God in the last day. Also, all who are upright in heart, the godly people, all who are truly righteous, will follow on in this path of justice. They will regard what God does as right and will walk in that path of righteousness. Verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evil doers when I am oppressed by the evil doers? Who will rise up for me? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. So in verse 16 he said, who will support me? Who will stand up for me? No one. Unless God has been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. So, until this righteousness is fulfilled, what is the condition of the godly here while they are persecuted and oppressed? Are, are they not left a prey to the evildoers? They are at their mercy without a deliverer. Who is going to protect us from the wicked? This question is not a question of doubt or unbelief, but it is a form of assertion that God's people have no helper except him. So these are the words of the psalmist representing the church of God under the persecution. The church of God under persecution says, who will rise up for me against the evil doers? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. So the answer to this question, no one absolutely no one except God. There is no one to deliver us except God. So they are not the people of God. We are not without a deliverer. God is our help. And this is part of our blessedness. That we are preserved and protected from the wicked by God himself. Otherwise, if God is not our protector, what will happen our soul would soon have settled in silence. What does it mean in silence? means the grief. By silence, he most probably means the grief. But St. Augustine said in his commentary, silence here means Hades. St. Augustine says, 
at I almost plunge it into that pit, Hades, which is preparing, prepared for the sinners, that's my soul had dwelt in hell. Meaning, if God did not deliver me and protected me from the wicked, actually I would end like the wicked in silence in, in hell. So their soul had gone down to the pit and silent land. As we read in Psalm 150, verse 17, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor anyone who go down into silence. So the psalmist declares that without God's help, he should have died and got into the silent land, into Hades. Unless God helps us, we would be nothing. God gives us comfort. He is there with his unfailing love. It is his unfailing love that can support us through the difficulties and trials of life. Like on the cross, all the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ left him. St. Paul shared the same experience when he was in prison. He said, all had abandoned me. No one came to me to in my defense. No one stood by the side of St. Paul. But God the Father was with the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and was with St. Paul in prison and in his defense. And as St. Paul said, God delivered me from the mouth of the lion. And the lion was Neron. Another respect in which the godly, even though suffering affliction, they are blessed. What is this another blessing? That God upholds their unsteady shaking feet. When we are oppressed or in persecution, we feel as if we are shaking. We are not stable. But God actually, when we feel shaken, God will support us. When we are in danger, God keeps us from falling, as we read in verse 18. If I say, my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. Once I cry to God and tell him, God, my foot slips, then your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. God mercies would sustain us in the difficult day. Even when it seems that our foot is slipped, the believer will not fall. But according to St. Augustine, here there is a confession. I have to confess and say, my foot slips. If I deny that my foot slips, I will not enjoy the mercies of God. That's why St. Augustine says, see how God loves the confession. Your foot has slipped and you say not, if you did not say, my foot has slipped, but you say, I am, uh, you are firm, when you are slipping, then the mercies of God will not help you. But the moment you begin to slip or waver and confess that you slip, that you may not lament your total fall, that God may help, so that your soul be not in hell. God loves the confession, loves the humility. Because when I say my foot slips, it is a humble confession. So with enemies and difficulties about the psalmist, the psalmist needed help and comfort from God. That's why in verse 19, beautiful verse, in the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comfort Delight my soul. So when there is persecution, hardships, and anxieties, worries, your comfort delight my soul. The Lord answered, when we have too many anxieties and worries, he will answer us with many comfort that bring delight to our soul. This will rescue us from the multitude of anxieties within us. Internal comfort is given by God himself to the perplexed and troubled in the spirit. 
And by this internal comfort, we'll be delighted, we'll be calmed and comforted. However, much he might be disturbed by other thoughts, if we are disturbed by all the persecution, trial, hardship, but we find rest and peace from God. God has an unfailing source of consolation. Whatever trouble might one have from the cares of life, from the evil imaginations in our mind, yet our soul in God will find repose and rest. Verse 20. Shall the throne of iniquity, which devises evil by law, have fellowship with you? So he's asking God. The throne of iniquity, that they use the law, the law and the power to devise evil. Can these people have fellowship with you, God? So the psalmist knew that wickedness is sometimes found in high places, thrones. Some thrones are marked by iniquity, and some law of countries are devised by evil, like in the time of slavery. But these people will never have fellowship with God. There can be no fellowship between light and darkness, between God and evildoers especially those who carry out their wicked purposes under the form of the law. Like when there were laws to persecute Christians, these people, this government, cannot have fellowship with God. Yes, may God will tolerate them for a time and will allow them to prosper for a time, but it is inconceivable that God should let these cruel judges shelter themselves under his authority. The throne of iniquity, this is a very fit expression for an oppressive and unjust government. It means iniquity in high places, in authority. Wickedness enthroned upon the judgment seat and sin fence delivering its unjust sentences. So the allusion here is probably to what was referred to in the former part of the psalm, the power that were spreading desolation through the land, those who were killing the stranger, the widow, the fatherless, these wicked princes or rulers as we read from verse 3 to 7. The worst crime that can be committed when the rulers actually devise this law to actually persecute the people or to oppress the people. So they are using the form of justice because law should be a form of justice to mask their injustice. This kind of wickedness was described previously in verse 4 to 6 when they actually killing innocent blood. St. John, in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 13, he said, Don't marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Unjust leaders can claim that God is on their side. And then they can claim that they worship God. But it is not true. Because their actions do not reflect the character of God. The wicked gather together and plot against the righteous and seek shedding the blood of the righteous. This was a prophecy of what would happen in the future when they tried and crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, when the devil and his host gathered together against him with Pontius Pilate, with Herod, with the religious leader of Israel, when the hosts of darkness sought to shed the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he said in verse 21, they gathered together against the life of the righteous, as Pontius Pilate, as Herod, 
as the religious leaders of Israel, as the people of, the, of Israel said, crucify him, crucify him, they gathered together again in the, right, the life of the righteous and condemned innocent blood. But the Lord has been my defense, my God, the rock of my refuge. So yes, they gather together, the devil, his angels, his children, they are in unity in everything that's evil. But though the wicked who were set against the psalmist were in high places in authority, but David or the psalmist, he had a greater defense. God himself is the rock of his refuge, as he said, the rock of my refuge. So in all these purposes of the wicked, in all that they do, whether under the form and sanction of the law, or by another means, the psalmist's trust is still in God. Last verse. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. So, the, he has brought on them their own iniquity means they will reap the consequences of their sin. God will punish them as they deserve. Their doom would be connected to their own iniquity and in their own wickedness they were perish. The punishment would fit the crime and those who had cut off others, killed others, themselves they will be cut off. This was his confidence and defense. If you remember verse 1, he said, God of vengeance, God of vengeance, he repeated twice. And here he repeated, cut them off twice. To give emphasis to the idea. And this repetition matches the repetition of vengeance in the first verse of the psalm. So as if what he prayed for in verse, in verse 1 was fulfilled in verse 23. So the psalm started with trusting God to set things right, that he shine forth and to take vengeance on the wicked and ends with the same confidence that the wicked will be cut off. He has brought on them their own iniquity and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. The Lord our God shall cut them off. This concludes Psalm 94. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Okay, no. I was out. Sorry.